Hello all, let's talk about 37 literary terms you need to know. The first one I wanna talk about is called alliteration. Now the word alliteration sounds kind of scary, but it's actually a really easy concept. It's just a series of words or phrases that all begin with the same letter. You see this every day in your normal life because it's an excellent way to advertise. It's really easy to remember things that are alliterative and they catch our attention, which is why writers use them in literature. So think about some of the most famous businesses that you know, PayPal, Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme, Coca-Cola, these all have alliterative names. The next word I want you to know is illusion. Now don't get this mixed up with illusion, which is like a magic a reference to another famous piece of work. Okay, so I want you to take a look at this clip from the Pirates of Penzance. This is a very famous song called Modern Major General. I am the very model of a modern major general. I've information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England, and I quote the facts historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. Sound familiar? If you are a big Hamilton fan like I am, you may remember George Washington singing these exact same words, uh, only a little bit remixed. Now I'm the model of a modern major general, the venerated Virginian veteran who's been a wall lining up to put me up on a pedestal, writing letters to relatives embellishing my elegance and eloquence. The Starbucks logo is another example of an illusion. On the logo, you can see a picture of a siren. Now, if you're familiar with Greek mythology, the siren was this mythical creature that looks like a mermaid, but with two tails. The sirens are sometimes depicted as beautiful and sometimes hideous, but either way, they both share the same thing in common. They have beautiful singing voices. Um, these sirens would sing lovely, lovely tunes, and sailors who have been out to sea for a long time would hear the voice of what they thought was a beautiful woman and they would immediately turn their ships and head towards the voice little did they know these sailors were usually headed towards their deaths because they would usually crash on jagged rocks or be killed in some unfortunate way now you may be wondering why on earth would a company want to have this on their logo well i want you to think about it if you are a coffee fanatic like me if i'm driving down the road and i see the starbucks sign uh i put on my blinker to exit okay so just like the song of the siren is drawing the sailors that logo is drawing me to turn my course and head towards the siren all right um it's something that it's like almost irresistible and caffeine being an addictive substance is ir irresistible to some. So there's actually kind of a really interesting little parallel there. The next term I want you to know is analogy. Now, an analogy is just a comparison of two different things. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I know the difference between a metaphor, a simile, and an analogy? Well, we know that similes use like or as, so we can kind of negate that. Uh, but the metaphor is a very simplified, usually um, one sentence comparison. Uh, she was a rose, okay? Uh, you can have an extended metaphor, but typically a metaphor is short and sweet. An analogy is more of a comparison of a situation to another situation, okay? I want you to think about the animated movie Inside Out, okay? Inside Out uh, is just one huge long analogy because all of the different emotions within the movie are showing you an analogy for how our mind works. The next word I want you to know about is anecdote. It's not to be confused with antidote, which is like a medicine. An anecdote is a type of short, amusing story. It's usually used to kind of get the point across or to capture a reader or an audience's attention. I want you to think about TED Talks. If you've ever watched any TED Talks, a vast majority of them begin with an anecdote, which is just a personal story about your own life. If you've ever watched The Princess Bride, you might remember that the grandpa has a really funny line where he says when i was your age television was called books 
Next, let's talk about direct and indirect characterization. All right, characterization is just where you build a character. So you have nothing when your reader or your audience starts and you give details and information that builds a person. Now, direct characterization is exactly what it sounds like. It's direct, it is explicitly stated. So when Hagrid from Harry Potter says, You're a wizard, Harry. He is giving direct characterization that Harry is a wizard. Indirect characterization is something that we have to infer based on the context clues. So if I said something to you like Jeff walked up to Mark, took the sandwich off his plate, took a bite, smirked at Mark, and then smashed the sandwich on the table. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is aggressive. Um, I would I have not told you that Jeff is a big jerk. I haven't told you that he's a bully. I haven't told you that Mark is maybe a more um, submissive person, uh, but you kind of gathered that from that one little scenario. So that would be an example of indirect characterization. Dialect is a form of language that's particular to a specific region or social group. If you want to think about the United States of America, we have a lot of dialects. For example, in some areas of the United States, people say soda. Uh, up in the Midwest, people say pop. If you're from Texas like me, you say Coke no matter what the drink is. If somebody asks me if I want a Coke, I say, yes, please bring me a Sprite. <laughs> um, another example of dialectical differences would be the fact that here in Texas, I say y'all. Um, in other places, you hear the words you guys and way up in uh, the Northeast, you hear you guys. The next word is dialogue. We all know what dialogue is. It's just a conversation between two or more people. In writing, it's denoted with quotation marks. Let's talk about dynamic characters and static characters. Now, the Greek root D-Y-N means to change. So a dynamic character changes or grows throughout the story. Sometimes they can change to become evil. Um, a lot of times you're gonna see that they change to become good. So for example, the Grinch is a dynamic character. Simba from The Lion King is also a dynamic character. And one of the most famous examples of a dynamic character, in my opinion, would be Ebenezer Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. He starts off as a mean old crotchety jerk and he has that experience with the three ghosts and by the end he is charitable and kind and thinking of others. Now a static character, I want you to think about the Greek root S-T-A. Uh, it kind of looks like the word stay, okay? They stay the same. A static character stays the same throughout the story. So you may think of someone like um, the Wicked Witch from The Wizard of Oz. She is mean, mean, mean until she dies in The Wizard of Oz. Now, if you watch Wicked, she is a dynamic character. Um, but in The Wizard of Oz, she is, uh, she is static. Hagrid from Harry Potter is also a static character. He is lovable at the beginning and he stays lovable through the middle. And guess what at the end? We still love him. That's a static character. And then finally, another example I can think of is Scar from The Lion King. Scar is evil, 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 and then more evil, all evil. The next two words I want to talk to you about are fiction and nonfiction. Now, you probably know these words already, but I know when I was a student, for some reason, I always got them confused. Um, so I want you to think of the F in fiction as fake. So fiction is fake. It's made up. Nonfiction is not fake. It's a story based on a real life event. The term figurative language is basically just a blanket statement that covers all different kinds of literary devices that authors use. So similes, metaphors, oxymorons, alliterations, idioms, onomatopoeias, personifications, hyperboles, puns. These are all examples of figurative language. The next term is foil. And foil is when you have two characters that deeply contrast each other. So you have like very good, very evil sometimes, okay? Or maybe you just have two great characters or two evil characters, but they have really different personalities. When an author puts two characters like this next to each other, it highlights the differences, okay? The way I remember this is I actually think of a real piece of foil. It's shiny on one side and it's dull on the other, okay? So in a foil relationship in literature, you have one person who's shiny and maybe one person who's dull. 
figuratively speaking. Let me give you an example of this in real life. If you've ever heard of the comedian Kevin Hart, here's a picture of him, uh, you may know that he is kind of a short person. Now, if you're a big basketball fan, you may have heard of a person named Shaquille O'Neal. Some people call him Shaq. <laughs> he is a very tall person. Now, I can tell you that Kevin Hart is short and that Shaq is tall, and you get it, you understand, but to really, really highlight Kevin Hart's shortness and Shaq's tallness, I would put them right next to each other. This creates a stark contrasting difference that really highlights the difference for the audience. It spells it out so that nothing is left to chance. The next term is foreshadowing. Now foreshadowing is something that we're probably all familiar with. It's just a hint or an indirect statement that indicates something that's going to happen in the future. Okay, uh, the most recent example I can think of this is in Wonder Woman 1984. When we meet the woman who is soon to be the villainess of the film, she kind of makes some foreshadowing type remarks. Great. Have a nice day. <laughs> those are cool. I like those. The animal print. <laughs> <laughs> so spoiler alert, she does end up being this scary cat-like lady. <laughs> So when she comments on the cat print at the beginning of the film, it's a little hint as to what's about to happen to her. And fans of the comics probably caught that hint and knew exactly which villain she was going to be. The next word is genre. And a genre is just a category of literature or entertainment. So you might have comedy, you might have history, you might have romance, sci-fi, thrillers, horror, biographies, sports. Okay, these are all types of genres. Next, we have hyperbole. Now, I want you to remember your Greek roots. Hyper means above or beyond. So a hyperbole is something that is an extreme exaggeration. It's way above and beyond what is actually real. I'm so hungry. I could eat a horse. They are using hyperbole. It's an extreme exaggeration. One of my favorites is, oh, I have a million pounds of work to do today. <laughs> of course, I don't have a million pounds of work to do. This is just an exa exaggeration to highlight that it feels like a lot. That brings us to the word idiom. An idiom is just a phrase that's not translatable. It's like a phrase that everybody who speaks one language knows, but people who came in and maybe they are unfamiliar with the culture or the language would not understand. For example, if I said, I have butterflies in my stomach, a person who's not a native English speaker and maybe not from America might not know what the heck I'm talking about because I don't have literal butterflies in my stomach. I had a job back when I was in high school and my boss was from a different country. And I remember one time he said, you people in Texas, everything's always broken. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, you're always fixing to. I'm fixing to do this. I'm fixing to do that. Why is everything always broken? <laughs> Well, in Texas, the phrase fixin' to is an idiomatic expression, and everybody knows it means I am about to, or I will soon do this. But when he came over and he was still kind of getting his legs under him with learning English, he had no idea what I was talking about. Let's talk about irony. Irony is just when something that you did not expect to happen happens. Now there are three main types of irony. The first type is verbal irony. Now verbal just means it's spoken. So it's when you say something that you don't really mean. I want you to think along the lines of sarcasm. So if I said, hey everybody, I want you to write a 10 page essay this weekend for homework. You might say, wow, thank you. I love writing 10 page essays on my weekend. All right, you're being verbally ironic and maybe a little rude, all right, um, because what you're saying is not what you actually mean. And it's certainly not what I would expect you to say if I were to give you that assignment. The second kind of irony, so we have verbal, the second kind is situational. Now, situational is what it sounds like. It's where the situation is ironic, okay? Um, the Titanic, although it was a tragedy, it was also an example of situational irony. It was considered to be an unsinkable ship. It's one of the only ships ever to claim that. And what did it do? It sank. All right. <laughs> 
And the third type of irony, so we have verbal, we have situational. The third type of irony is dramatic irony. And dramatic irony is really easy to understand because it's basically when you as the audience know what's about to happen, but the character doesn't, okay? So I want you to think about Jaws. When we hear the music, we know. We know that a shark is coming, but obviously the swimmer in the film has no idea that a shark is coming. Romeo and Juliet is dripping with dramatic irony. That story is told from a third person omniscient view. And so we see everything that's going on, but the characters can only see what's in front of them. And so like, we know Juliet's not dead. Hey, Juliet! (laughs) wake up Romeo don't drink the poison we know all of this okay but they don't know it that's dramatic irony we touched on this a little bit earlier when we talked about analogies but now I want to discuss metaphors and similes metaphors and similes are so easy they're both comparisons it's just that a simile uses the words like or as so they're similar Okay, it's like this. A metaphor just says something is something else. You are a tree. I might say that to a very tall person if I were not, (laughs) if I didn't have my verbal filters on, I might say that. And that would be a metaphor because obviously the person I'm speaking to is not really a tree. They are just quite tall. You think you got it? Let's do a little quick quiz. You tell me, is it a metaphor or a simile? I ate like a hog. Of course, this is a simile because of the word like. Teaching me French is like trying to teach a poodle algebra. That's another simile because of the word like. John was no longer himself. He was merely a shell of the man he once was. Metaphor. John is not really a shell. He would die. All right, where are his organs? That is a metaphor. You are a shining star. You're not a big giant ball of burning gas millions and billions of miles away. You are just a great person and you're doing a good job. This is a metaphor. He was as mad as a bull. As is a simile. Good. Choosing that car insurance is as illogical as flushing your money down the toilet. That's a simile because I said as. Now, if I said choosing that car insurance is flushing your money down the toilet, that's a metaphor because I'm not literally flushing my money down a toilet. Last, life is a roller coaster. That is a metaphor. Life is not really a roller coaster. We're just comparing it to a roller coaster. Let's discuss the difference between tone and mood. Okay. Mood is the feeling you as the audience get when you take in a piece of art or literature. Okay. So whenever I'm watching a scary movie, I might feel like, I feel a lot of suspense or I feel a lot of fear. That's a mood that the author has created, okay? Now, tone is how the author feels. So I want you to see the difference there. Mood is more focused on the feelings of the audience, whereas tone is more focused on the feelings of the author. So maybe um, the author has a sarcastic tone or maybe like a really loving tone or a passionate tone. I really just need you to know this, okay? Um, Um, These are all examples of tone. So tone is about the author. Mood is about the audience. Let's talk about motivation. Motivation is just the reason a character does what he or she does. The first example that comes to my mind is from The Princess Bride. Indigo Montoya's father was killed when he was just a child. And he spends the next, what we assume is a couple of decades, training searching and planning for the day that he can take revenge on the man who killed his father. That is everything that motivates him. And spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, when he no longer has that motivation, he has to sit and kind of think about what he might do next. Now, motif is simply a recurring element within a piece of literature or art. Another way to put it, it's a callback. 
the way I remember this is that the M in motif stands for mind control, okay? Um, an author uses motif when he wants to manipulate how the audience feels without having to go into a lot of detail making them feel that way. So for example, we'll go back to the example of Jaws. I've never seen it, maybe you haven't either, but we all know that classic musical motif. And we all know to be afraid because a shark is coming when we hear those two notes over and over again. I don't even have to have seen the movie for that sound to create a visceral reaction in me. Like I can feel my, my chest get kind of tight and my stomach get a little bit nervous. Like I have a reaction and I've never even seen the movie. Have you ever heard of a scientist named Pavlov? Pavlov was this very famous scientist who basically uh, noticed that when he was feeding his dogs that they would start to drool even before he handed them the food. They drooled just in anticipation of knowing that the food was coming. This intrigued him and so he did this experiment where he would ring a bell and then give the dogs the food and he'd ring the bell and give the dogs the food and ring a bell and give the dogs the food and he noticed that after a while every time he rung the bell even if he didn't give the dogs the food they started drooling because they had been trained to subconsciously expect something whenever they heard that sound. That is mind control. Motifs can happen in literature, but the easiest way to explain them is to use movies and musicals because one of the most common types of motifs is lighting and music. Okay, so I want to give you another example of a musical motif. It is from Hamilton. The character in Hamilton called Aaron Burr usually gives the expositional or the expository details. So basically all of the things that they don't want to act out with all of the actors, Aaron Burr comes on and sings the song and kind of tells you what's going on. Now, the important thing about motif is number one, we've been trained that when he comes out, we need to listen because he's about to give us all kinds of information. The second thing that you need to know about motif is if it's changing throughout the story, then we are able to know that without the author coming right out and telling us. Let's listen to how Aaron Burr's musical motif changes throughout the play and how that indicates the way the story has progressed. a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by Providence and impoverished and squalor. 1789, how does the bastard, orphan, immigrant, decorated war vet, unite the colonies through more debt, fight the other founding father, still he has to forfeit, have it all, lose it all, you ready for more, yeah, treasury secretary, Washington's the president, every American experiment sets a precedent, not too fast, and we came along to resist him, lift him off until we had a two-party system, haven't met him yet, haven't had the chance, cause he's been kicking ass as the ambassador of but someone's got to keep the American promise You simply must be Thomas, Thomas I was having an arrogant immigrant orphan bastard horse Somehow endorsed Thomas Jefferson, his enemy A man he's despised since the beginning Just to keep me from winning I want to be in the room where it happens You hear him get angrier and angrier you know by that last time that he sings things are about to go down and sure enough that's right before the big finale i won't spoil it for you if you don't know but just know after that last one things get real the next part i want you to know is narrative and narrative is easy it's just a story it can be fiction or non-fiction so fake or not fake um but it has to be a story with like 
characters and a rising action and a climax and a falling action and a, and a solution, okay? So for example, How to Train Your Dragon, that's a story. Um, the How to Train Your Dragon complete book of dragons, that's a handbook. It's fiction, but it's not an actual story. So it's not a narrative. Another example would be Harry Potter. Harry Potter is a story, but the unofficial Harry Potter spell book is simply just a piece of fiction. It's not a narrative. You probably already know this word, onomatopoeia. An onomatopoeia is just a word that's used to represent a sound. We see this in all kinds of superhero comic books uh, where you hear like, or you see the word pow or bang or boing or zoink, you know. <laughs> I don't know what is soy, but you hear all of these different examples and those words are meant to depict a sound so that you can hear the sound in your mind. Personification is giving human attributes to things that are not human. So if I say uh, the wind howled in the night, the wind does not howl. It's not a person or an animal. So that is personification. The leaves danced their way through the lawn. You get a picture of what they look like you imagine that wind carrying those leaves through the lawn, but they're not alive and they're not dancing. That is personification. The next word is perspective. And perspective is just the eyes through which the reader sees the story. This happens a lot. One of the more entertaining examples I can think of is the movie, The Secret Life of Pets. We know what it's like as humans to own pets, but we got to have a little look into the world of what pets see and the same life that we live, we're seeing it through their perspective or through their eyes. Some other examples of this would be A Bug's Life, Ants, um, the play Wicked. Okay, so the Wizard of Oz tells the story from the perspective of Dorothy, but Wicked tells the story of the Wizard of Oz from the perspective of Elphaba, who is the Wicked Witch. Now, perspective is not to be confused with point of view. Point of view is an actual literary term, and there are actually three main points of view. First person point of view, third person limited, and third person omniscient. The biggest mistake I see students make is that they write second person point of view on their exams or tests. There's no such thing as second person point of view. All right, so let's talk about the different types. First person point of view is the story is told through the eyes of the character. So if you're a video gamer, think like first person shooter games. That is first person point of view. Um, Imagine that view in a novel. You're seeing everything from the main character's perspective. Third person limited is like a fly on the wall. So if I had a fly on the wall, I want you to imagine that he's sitting there and he's just watching everything that's going on. Maybe this is a very smart fly and he's writing down everything that's happening. All he can do is observe and write down what's happening externally. He does not know my thoughts or my feelings. He can take a good guess, but he doesn't know he can't read my mind. And that brings us to the third type of point of view, which is third person omniscient. Third person omniscient is the godlike figure. They are all knowing. They can not only see every single thing that's going on everywhere, but they can read the minds and they know the thoughts and the feelings of each character and they will usually share it. The next words I want you to know are protagonist and antagonist. Now, pro means for or good or going towards. So I want you to think of the protagonist as the character who is advancing the goal of the story, okay? Some people say the protagonist is the good guy. That's not always true, but it's usually true. So if you remember that the protagonist is the good guy, you'll probably be okay. There are a few examples of a protagonist who is actually the bad guy. The main one that comes to my mind is Wicked. Um, Alphaba is the Wicked Witch, and she is the protagonist of the story Wicked. Another example, if you like scary shows, <laughs> would be Dexter. Dexter is a murderer, but he's the protagonist of the story. The antagonist, I want you to think of A-N-T, anti, against, okay? The antagonist is the character that's working against against the main plot. So the antagonist is usually the bad guy, like Jafar from Aladdin or Scar from The Lion King. But sometimes the antagonist is a good guy. 
So if you ever watched Breaking Bad, the antagonist is actually a really, really good guy. He, he, he's a cop and he's like super legit and wonderful, but he's the antagonist of the story, one of them. The next word is pun, and pun is just a joke that exploits the different meanings or the similar sounds of a certain word. Now, that definition kind of sounds like... So let me just show you this quick video from a great YouTube channel called The Pun Guys. It's full of dad jokes. Dad jokes usually have puns involved, so enjoy. Look, it's a Keurig. Oh, what does it do? Cook Keurig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you like them apples? <laughs> what are you saying, yo? I was checking out that fork, eh? Didn't <laughs> <laughs> that the song that Samsung? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yo, Dan, have you seen a waste basket? Yeah, I got you, bro. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Dude, you're not in sync. Yes, I am. <laughs> this is a magic bowl lit. And this is a magic bowl lit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh God. God. <laughs> Panasonic. Panasonic. <laughs> Yo, look, it's Adele. <laughs> Yo, have you seen my little brother? Huh? Yo, where's my little brother? Oh, there you are. Don't scare me like that. <laughs> cool. You can go right now. We go. So much attitude, this guy. He's got a chip on his shoulder. <laughs> the next word is purpose. And to be more specific, we're talking about author's purpose. I want you to know why people write. And the reason why people write can be narrowed down into three main reasons. To persuade, P. To inform, I. To entertain, E. It's easy as pie. I want you to know what a story map is and all of the elements of a story map. You probably already learned this before, but we start with an exposition. We rise, rise, rise with action until we finally hit the climax. And then once everything is tied up in a knot in a huge mess, we go down, down, down with falling action and finally resolve everything in the resolution. The next two words are subjective and objective. Now, subjective is when you present information, but you have your own personal thoughts, feelings, and opinions injected into your writing. Sometimes this is okay. If you're writing an editorial or an opinion piece or a blog or a social media post, subjective writing is completely fine. But for academic writing, you probably want to use objective writing. And objective writing is information that's based only on the facts, the figures, and reality alone. The way I remember this is subjective means I'm going to subject you to my opinion. Objective means I object to using anything but facts and figures. A man lives on the top floor of a hotel. When he goes back, if he comes back with a friend or if it's a rainy day, he rides the elevator all the way up to the top. If he comes back alone or if it's a sunny day, he rides the elevator only halfway up and then walks the stairs the rest of the way. Why? If you're wishing I would give you an answer, I've just built suspense. Suspense is just a feeling of excitement or anxious uncertainty about what's going to happen. I'm not going to tell you why the man walks from the stairs. The next word is syntax. And syntax kind of sounds like sentence. So I want you to remember that syntax is the arrangement of the words in a sentence. Let me give you an example. Which of the following two sentences would make you want to take this new drug? Although the drug is highly effective, it has significant side effects. Or although the drug has significant side effects, it's highly effective. If you chose number two, that's because the syntax convinced you that even though there's side effects, it's really, really effective. Um, when we are wanting to manipulate how the reader feels about something, or we want to force the reader to emphasize a certain point or a certain aspect of what we're saying, we will put those words at the end of our sentence because the end of the sentence packs the most punch and it is the most persuasive part of a sentence. So you always want to end strong. The next word is theme. Now, um, some students get theme confused with things like genre. 
but a theme is just an overall idea, sometimes like a moral of the story or just general subject that the story talks about. So maybe the theme is coming of age, like Tom Sawyer, the book Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain is a coming of age story about little Tom. Okay. So the theme is growing up and maybe the theme is justice. So you have the movie and the book, A Time to Kill, and you have a man who is going to trial because he's killed two men who hurt his daughter. And so the theme is what is justice here? Should this man be punished for killing these two men after they brutally, brutally injured and traumatized his daughter? Justice is the theme. Another theme could be uh, love or heroism, good versus evil, uh, deception could be a theme, okay? These are all examples of themes. The next word I want you to know is conflict. Now, in conflict, we can really sum up conflict in five different ways. Every good story has conflict. If you don't have conflict, it's not a story. So the first type of conflict I want you to know is man versus man. This is a pretty standard form of conflict I want you to think about like Batman versus the Joker that's a man versus man conflict the second type of conflict I want you to think about is something like man versus society if you've ever read the Hunger Games uh, Katniss Everdeen is the main character and society is the actual world that she lives in and the government that's forcing children to go and participate in these horrific Hunger Games so the Hunger Games would be man versus society. The other type of conflict I want you to know about is called man versus self. This is when you have kind of like this inner turmoil and you're trying to decide what you should do or what you shouldn't do. A good example of this is from the movie called Liar Liar, where Jim Carrey plays a lawyer and he is not allowed to tell a lie based on some kind of magic that is going on in the movie. Um, and so you see him like really, really, really wanting to tell a lie because he wants to win his case. Um, but also not being able to, he's in deep conflict with himself. Another example of man versus self can be seen in the movie Tangled when Rapunzel is finally free from the tower and she is really conflicted because she is so excited, but she also doesn't want to hurt Mother Gothel. I can't believe I did this! I can't believe I did this! I can't believe I did this! <laughs> Mother would be so furious. It's okay, I mean, she doesn't know we'll kill her, right? Oh my gosh, it's a cure! The fourth type of conflict that I want you to know about is called man versus technology. So this would be movies like I, Robot, where people are actually battling against robots or monsters that are technological, that are trying to take over the world. One of the more primitive examples of man versus technology would be Frankenstein because Frankenstein is a technological advance because he's like an amalgam of all of these different body parts put together. That was a technological advance of the time and it still would be, you can't really do that. Um, so uh, that would be an example of man versus technology. And then the last one I want you to know is called man versus nature. And it is what it sounds like. So when you have a story where the person's main conflict is nature or something in nature, that's man versus nature. Some big examples I can think of would be the reef, like any kind of shark movie, Jaws, uh, 47 meters down, like all of those would be man versus nature because they're fighting shark. What's that one with the girl who is like, there's alligators everywhere? Oh, I can't remember. Maybe I'll remember. <laughs> and then my uh, one of the first things I think of when I'm thinking about man versus nature is the movie Castaway. Tom Hanks is deserted on this remote island all by himself after a plane crash. And he really has to fight the elements of nature in order to survive, not only physically, but mentally. He is really at odds with nature. And the last word I want you to know is understatement. It is what it sounds like. It's acting as though something is smaller or worse or not as important as it actually is. So um, we do this all the time when we're about to get in trouble. Like maybe you got into a fight at school and you come home and you tell your mom like, yeah, uh, you know, there was a little, I had like a, a few words. I exchanged some words with so-and-so at school. Well, 
that is an understatement, right? If you got in a full out brawl, like throwing bows, this fight to say uh, we exchanged some words, it's definitely an understatement. One of the most classic examples of understatement I can think of, and one of the most comical examples would be from Monty Python. In this scene, the knight is trying to cross and there is a guard and the guard says, you shall not pass. And so the two begin to engage in a sword fight. And well, I'll just let you watch it and see what you think. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I've heard worse. You lie. Come on. And those are the literary terms. I hope you enjoyed this. If you're having trouble remembering these, put this on in the background in the mornings when you're getting ready for school or you're putting on makeup or you're, you know, doing a chore like washing the dishes. Put this on because it'll help you remember them. The more you hear it, the better you're going to get at remembering these terms. I'll see you next time.